Japanese games have come a long way, and their early impact in the industry has been massive all over the world. While a lot of its history is really interesting, not a lot of it has been properly recorded given what had happened in language barriers. Spike Chunsoft is a company whose visual novels I love and enjoy, and in looking into their history, I found that more interesting than their story was the story of their predecessor. One that goes way before the days of Spike Chunsoft or the early days of even Spike. This is the story of Human Entertainment, a Japanese game developer and publisher that made unique franchises, created the first game development school, bankrupted themselves, and split off into many different studios that went on to do amazing things. The story vaguely begins with conflicting dates on Human Entertainment's founding. The very early years of the company aren't well documented, but most say it started in the 80s. While Human's website said they were founded in 1983, interviews with former staff say it was really formed at around 1989. The confusion stems from the fact that Human first started off as a company called TRY, which was founded in 1983 by Choshiro Suzuki. Suzuki would later become Human Entertainment's president, so that's likely where Human's 1983 founding date arose originated from. There's not much recorded information on TRY, other than that they mostly developed NES games. In 1987, TRY and a music sequencer development company called Communicate merged and became Sonata. The name came from the first parts of all of the board members' names except Suzuki, who thought Sonata would be better than Su Sonata. Now, Sonata worked primarily as contract developers for companies like Nintendo, and it wasn't until they decided to publish games in 1989 that Sonata would reform and officially become human entertainment. At first, Human became well known from popular sports and racing games, titles like Super Formation Soccer, Final Match Tennis, and F1 Pole Position. One of the biggest franchises they're directly credited for is the Fire Pro Wrestling series. It originally centered around Japanese pro wrestling, but eventually expanded into influences from pro wrestling all over the world. The series started in 1989 and had unique grappling, character creation, and AI systems. Unlike WWE games, most Fire Pro Wrestling games weren't licensed with official Japanese wrestling associations, and only used similar wrestlers with different names. The series became a classic and even had a reboot in 2017 with Spike Chunsoft's release of Fire Pro Wrestling World. The original 1989 Fire Pro Wrestling had a team of about 20 members developing it at Human Entertainment, most of which were artists and animators. But usually Human's other projects were very small teams of about 5 members. In fact, up until the making of Super Formation Soccer 95, projects there never even had any kind of director. Most decisions prior to that were made by the whole team, which resulted in a lot of games feeling unfocused. When the idea to have a director was first mentioned, it was argued among the members whether or not this was beneficial. Some even joked about it by declaring that they were directors of whatever they could think of, but they later understood the importance of a director role and decided to continue on with it. Overall, things were pretty flexible working at Human. Most of the time workers figured out their own roles and decided which projects they'd work on. This was largely due from how management at Human Entertainment was handled. They only cared about making money, and at the time they didn't care where it came from. They were barely involved in the development process of a lot of projects, leaving it up to the devs for the most part. Management was also more open to approving more unique projects in order to test the waters. Sometimes management would try to push devs to work on certain systems though. When the Virtual Boy came out and Nintendo needed games for it, management had pushed for that. But most of the devs saw the Virtual Boy as a complete failure and refused to make any games for it. When management finally convinced someone to work on it, it ended up being cancelled anyways. In fact, it was one of the only games they ever didn't publish. Nearly everything Human Entertainment made was published, no matter how bad it was. And despite management not being involved during development and taking risk on these projects, it left the devs more free with their work and ended up working out. In 1995, Human Entertainment first made a name for itself with the series Clock Tower. It was a survival horror point-and-click adventure inspired by horror films directed by Dario Argento. The gameplay consisted of running and hiding from the Scissor Man as players solve puzzles and progress through the story. When a player entered panic mode, their character would become more difficult to control, and each entry of the series also featured multiple endings. The first game was overall successful, but had some mixed reviews due to annoying puzzle and exploration mechanics. After the release of Resident Evil 1996, Six, Human Entertainment was so impressed that they wanted to make a Clock Tower 2. Captain Wesker, where's Chris? Stop it! Don't open that door!
and improve the sequel's quality significantly and make it their first 3D project. They had a team of about 30 members working hard to finish the project by December 1996 for the PlayStation. The sequel was marketed outside of Japan as just Clock Tower and sold over half a million copies. A third game, Clock Tower Ghost Head, was released in 1998, but it was the first installment without the original creator Hifumi Kono, and it ended up being a critical failure and is considered a spin-off of the series. Another popular horror series by Human Entertainment was Twilight Syndrome, a horror-themed adventure game released for the PlayStation in 1996 with heavy visual novel elements about high school girls investigating urban legends. It featured a lot of dialogue choices, realistic 3D sound, and had a character heart racing monitor mechanic. Due to scheduling conflicts, they had to release the original game as two parts. Twilight Syndrome became so popular that it even had three Japanese films based on it. The game's sequel, Moonlight Syndrome, released in 1997, with the story taking place in a parallel reality and focused more on the horror of people rather than the supernatural. The series was never released outside of Japan, and its director, Goichi Suda, said foreign audiences probably wouldn't understand it anyways. Spike Chunsoft would later reference Twilight Syndrome in Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair with a mini-game based on the series. In 1998, Human had released Mizerna Falls, a Twin Peaks-esque open-world adventure game focused on searching for a lost friend in a rural town. It was one of the first open world games that we know of and had a mechanic similar to Majora's Mask, where NPCs would do their own in-game timed events and have operating hours for businesses. It was also never released outside of Japan, but in 2017 it was translated into English by a freelance localizer and made into a patch. It was noted by the translator as being so innovative for its NPC timing and event triggers that it's difficult to actually tell when the game was experiencing bugs or when you had just messed something up with the story. In 1990, Human started the Human Creative School, which aimed to have experienced game developers teach students and ended up being the earliest known game creator school. At first, it was just taught in the basement of their Koichiji office, taught by employees upstairs when they had a break from development. The tuition was about the price of attending a Japanese trade school at the time, and many actually saw the school as just management trying to find another way to make money. But later on, they would move the school to another building connected to their office and hired proper teachers and retired developers to teach the courses. Most students felt they never really learned anything substantial from the classes, and that it was mostly a computer lab they could work at with someone to ask questions to. But they did say the connections they made both with the other students and the human staff were huge for them. Many Human Creative School graduation projects would be published by Human Entertainment and became massive successes, like The Firemen, Egypt, and SOS. Some students were later hired by Human Entertainment and would make a big influence to the company and to their future game projects. The fun times had to end eventually for Human, but most of the company knew it was coming. Management was ultimately what killed the company. Like a lot of other game studios, they only seemed to care about themselves. Despite having a lot of creative control, developers were kept on tight schedules, in constant states of crunch, and severely underpaid. And management would also hire their own relatives and place them into high positions, like the principal of Human Creative School. Nothing like a little bit of nepotism to make you some money, right? On top of all of that, management had driven up a $4 billion yen debt to the government by avoiding their taxes heavily for years. That's about 40 million US dollars. That kind of debt doesn't happen out of nowhere though, so most of the staff knew a year before that it was going under, some even said three years before that it was going to be going under, and it was just a matter of when. In 1999, Human had tried working on a restructuring deal, but things didn't work out and Human Entertainment declared bankruptcy in January 2000, closing its doors. The Human Creative School didn't close at first though. It lingered on after being bought by another company and renamed to Professo Creative School in 2001. But it didn't last long and stopped accepting students in 2002 before finally closing in 2003. The characters you know all brought to life. 
2000 was when human story ended, but many other stories were just getting started. Multiple game studios were founded from former human staff. Goichi Suda, director of Twilight Syndrome, had left human in 1996 and founded Grasshopper Manufacture, which went on to make games like Killer7 and No More Heroes. In 2002, Clock Tower creator Hifumi Kono founded the studio Nude Maker, which made games like Infinite Space, Steel Battalion, and a kick-started spiritual successor to Clock Tower called Night Cry. Another company consisting of former ex-human staff was was Sandlot, which was formed in 2001 and is most known for the popular Earth Defense Force franchise. Last but not least, there's Spike, which is where a lot of former human staff went when they left, and eventually most of humans' licensing were transferred to Spike. In many ways, Spike was even seen as the successor to human entertainment. It was originally founded in 1989 as Mizuki until they changed the name to Spike in 1997. At around that time, up until 2000, that was when a lot of staff moved over to Spike instead of human. And then later, Spike merged with Chunsoft in 2012 to become Spike Chunsoft. The company has gone on to become a massive publisher, localizing a large number of Japanese games, giving birth to many huge RPG, visual novel, and adventure franchises. They developed Danganronpa, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon, Zero Escape, 428 Shibuya Scramble, and Jump Force. They also internationally published the science adventure series developed by Magus. Big titles like Stein's Gate, Chaos Child, Robotics Notes, anything with the, the semicolon in the middle, it's probably from them. A deeper look into Spike Chunsoft Chunsoft and Magus as a future topic might be interesting for me to look into, but for now we'll leave the story there. Human Entertainment was a company that made a creative environment for developers to grow and make connections before falling apart from management problems and tax evasion, and then splitting off into bigger studios. I'd like to close this video with a quote from Clock Tower series director Hifumi Kono during an interview. Human is often referred to as a leading edge company, or a company that produced some genuinely unique games, but the truth is that the company had no official intention of doing so. The upper management management never encouraged us to create unique games. As Matori-san, myself, and Suda-san all experienced, there wasn't much teamwork or friendship at the company. Some of us just had an individualistic drive to create a particular work, convinced management to accept it, and went ahead with our own idiosyncratic projects. That's how Human ended up publishing such a diverse array of unique games. It wasn't due to the will of the company, but rather the will of the various individuals within the company. That's what makes Human so fascinating. Tag a friend, and we'll see you in the ring. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was tough to research, but I did my best. Let me know in the comments if you liked it and what you'd like me to talk about next. I do a lot of game development, anime, and programming related videos here. If you like that kind of stuff, you can subscribe to me here on YouTube, and you can also support me on Patreon for a dollar a month. Follow me on Twitter, follow me on Twitch, follow me in life, and I will talk to you all later.